Thank you, Dr. Sanders, for that wonderful and kind introduction. It is always a joy to be in your presence, the presence of greatness, as I like to say. I tell my students all the time, there is greatness in the land. And one place it's found is at Howard University Divinity School with the great Cheryl Sanders. So I am so pleased to be in your presence, even digitally. Friends, it is a joy for me to be here with you tonight. I had looked forward to us being together in person, but as you all know, the pandemic continues to rage. The vibrant is very active. And so we will have to settle on this way in which the Holy Ghost creates community. But it is, it is my honor to be with you. I bring you warmest greetings from Dean Gregory Sterling, the faculty, the staff, and the students, of Yale Divinity School, we are joined with you in the glorious and exciting task of theological education. As I look at the screen, I see so many people who I've known for many years. And so I won't start calling names, but please know that hugs and kisses goes out to all of you who are here on the screen, who I've known for many years. And let me just say to those of you who I'm looking at, you all haven't, you, you haven't aged one day. You look exactly the same as you had 10, 20, maybe even 25 years ago. Because I know I look, I look the same. <clears throat> My friends, there is probably no form of academic work more exciting or challenging right now than doing theological education, especially in the Western world and in the United States. We theological educators <clears throat> are working to recommend Christian theological studies and religious studies more generally in a time not only of their diminished prestige, which we all know, but also in a time when the witness of Christianity is as dismal as it has ever been in the Western world. We are working to commend a way of life and an intellectual enterprise that looks neither compelling nor flourishing to a lot of people, especially a lot of younger people. And we are working to promote an educational formation that is profoundly troubled. It is time we realize that there is a work that is inside our work of theological education that we need to be about today. Some of us, many of on this screen, have been engaged in this work, this, let's call it the inner work of theological education indirectly. But now, now it's time, my friends, for us all to engage it directly. That work, that work is to turn theological education against the finished man. The finished man is a wounding dream that has always been with us. Its basic contours gestured nicely through what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the secut deus, the false image of God, a false image of a completeness that danced in the fantasies of Adam and Eve as they looked on the fruit of the forbidden tree and imagined themselves wise and prepared after the eating, after the disobedience, to live in a new world. It is a new world envisioned through the eyes of the colonial masters that created for us this inner work, a work against a work, and thereby a becoming against a becoming, a building against a building, and a formation, my friends, against a formation. This is a complicated task because it is fighting on the move, going from one scene of battle to the next, and in each scene, tearing something down while you are trying to build something up. How do you tear down a dream of becoming a powerful and compelling dream that can easily pull you in so deeply that you end up only tearing down the impediments 
to their dream. The colonial master's dream has been elegant and efficient in pulling forward ancient strands of ambition. Imagine, imagine that you have come into possession of lands and waterways, plants and animals, minerals, precious stones and people. And you begin to build a productive place. You have learned your Lockean lessons. What I cultivate, I own with God's approval. And now you are realizing profit and power that you and your ancestors had never known or even imagined. It is then that you realize, it is then that you look at the world you are creating and at that same moment, look at your children that you seek to cultivate. And you ask the question that will join those two creations in progress. Who must my sons and daughters become in order to inherit my world and continue to build it better? Who must my sons and daughters become in order to inherit my world and continue to build it better? Your question travels into your children like genetic coding making them susceptible to a tragic answer. Who must they become? They must become white, self-sufficient men, able to show in body and mind, in action and reaction, control, possession, and mastery. They must be able to control their passions and urges, their anger, and their enthusiasm. <laughs> they must be in possession of strong minds and bodies and able to maintain possession of what they have been given and what they will inherit. And they must be prepared to face the unknown with a commitment to its mastery. And from one obstacle to the next, to go from mastery to mastery. They must show their finish. This finish is a beginning to life with power, a life that begets power, aims for profit and productivity, and a promise to be a builder. The children of the masters will seek a becoming and thereby will aspire to the finish. All of Western education, my friends, is formed between the dream of the colonial master and the aspirations of his sons and daughters. What does it mean? What does it mean to be inside someone else's dream? What does it mean to be inside the aspirations of another? And what does it mean to be educated between dream and aspiration? Now, these are the questions that theological education is obliged, is obligated to answer because it was theological educators who positioned all of us inside and between this dream and these aspirations and placed us all on this path of questioning. Theological educators were there at the beginning when this new world formed, beholding and sharing in the master's clutching and claiming the responsibility to educate all toward the good. All toward the good. Christian theological studies have always been an experiment aiming to see if we human creatures could be instructed to follow more precisely and more faithfully the living God. But that instruction has been caught up in the master's clutching. And so the experiment has been troubled to the point of being traumatizing to many. Yet this is trauma oftentimes covered with success. You can cover a lot of trauma with success. Many people through their theological education have been successfully formed 
into white, self-sufficient men. We should think here of that successful formation as noun and verb. As noun, we mean the showing of a finish and the beginning of an individual performance of control, possession, and mastery. As verb, we mean the willingness to submit to a forming process focused through the specifics of study, of texts, languages, ideas, objects, concepts that habituate us in a particular kind of dismal focus. Now, I am not suggesting that scholarly focus is dismal in and of itself. It being an activity inside a wider, wonderful life calling of paying attention. We hit the problem when cultivating scholarly focus fuses with cultivating the racial myopia of white masculinist scholarly form. The racial myopia of white masculinist scholarly form. That racial myopia grew inside the long rise of processes of objectification and commodification. These processes were endemic to what Felipe de Scola calls naturalist schemas that form layers of isolating practices that run from the body to plants and animals and to the land itself. We have been formed with narrowed sight lines. We have been formed with narrow sight lines in order to form others with narrowed sight lines. A poem for us. I remember, <clears throat> I remember when the five young white doctors in their white coats, four men, one woman, came into our hospital room, my wife and I having our first baby, my wife in pain, I in pain, watching her pain, together waiting for the nurse to return with the epidural. The five white doctors in their white coats entered the room, looked at me, looked at my wife, said nothing to us, then looked at the machines connected to my wife, looked at the chart, and stood exactly two feet from us, huddled in a circle. They talked together about my wife, my life as though she, we, were nothing more than a living cadaver. I felt the old anger rising, rising in me. I wanted to throw my chair at them and follow it with spit in their faces. But my wife needed my attention, my full attention. Thankfully, the nurse, she was Ethiopian, returned to the room. Her words, her words to the doctors were my salvation. Would you mind stepping in the hallway? I need to administer the epidural, she said. They left the room and took their focus. Narrowed sight lines do allow us to see details with precision and insight. The trauma shows itself, shows in what we have been trained to unsee, or more precisely, what we have been trained not to see, namely ourselves or others in their full humanity. The trauma <clears throat> also lurks in how we want to be seen as serious, but in a constrained way, sifted down to only a voice recognized and respected. Words on a page. This, of course, is reward that comes with the racial myopia of white masculinist scholarly form. 
Theological education formed white sufficient men who would in turn establish a formation process, not only aiming toward whiteness, but constituted in whiteness, whiteness, whiteness. To speak of whiteness is to speak of a historical process of identity reconstruction. Whiteness is not phenotype, we know this. Not, it is not appearance, not first appearance or biology or culture, and certainly not a part of God's creation. Whiteness is a way of seeing the world and a way of being in the world at the same time. Whiteness is a way of organizing the world, making sense of the world. And whiteness is having the power. Whiteness is having the power to order one's world by that effort. Whiteness is an engine of aspiration. So when we say a white self-sufficient man, we are not talking about some particular guy of the past or the present, but an invitation offered to everyone, male, female, gay, trans, non-binary, of every ethnicity, class, or social status, nationality, anyone and everyone touched by Western education. It is an invitation to become someone significant by learning to see like the master. I wish to counter the plantation pedagogy that aims to form masters with a pedagogical vision rooted in another image, Jesus and the crowd. This image is deeply theological, profoundly Christological, but not Christian in the strictest sense of that theological designation. Jesus and the crowd is an image that does not present an imperial position from which to think, listen, and learn, but a reality of chaos where the lack of control the lack of possession, the lack of mastery meets Jesus and the disciples. The crowd cannot be made self-sufficient. Indeed, the crowd exposes the truth that Jesus and his disciples are joined with them in need for God's help. And in so doing, it is the crowd that forces an exegesis. The crowd, they will be the catalysts for the exegesis of God in Jesus. My friends, theological education cannot be done well. It cannot be done well without sensing the screaming crowds comprised of people crying out in pain and suffering desperate for help, shoulder to shoulder with their enemies, ready to kill them at the slightest offense and the first opportunity. And there in the midst, an uneasy silence emerges as those same people strain to hear the sound of God in the voice of Jesus. Another poetic offering for us before, before the confession. Before the confession, here was crying out. Before the teaching, here was feeling terror. Before the word spoken, here was longing for you have heard it said, here now, breathing, reaching, waiting, people sensing the many, salvation beginning. It is Jesus and the crowd that opens up for us, the overarching goal of formation for us, to gather people together, to gather people who would never, ever normally be together, but are together for the new possibilities of life with God. What would it mean, my friends, to have an educational endeavor centered in belonging? This is belonging, not understood as sentiment or romantic longing, 
but as a centering intellectual reality for our work, a centering intellectual reality for our work. The Western Academy as it exists now has banished belonging, found it to be an impediment to a clear eyed focus on the individual and the instilling of the performative logics that guide our evaluative ecologies. We have been shaped to think that the one destined to order and control the many must be focused upon. And so the question becomes in this dismal schema, what is required for that one to rule, to lead? I propose a thinking of and with the many in order to locate the one. And after whiteness, I outline what I believe is necessary for this thinking and the reversal of the pedagogical direction of Western education toward the white self-sufficient man. In what remains of my lecture, I would like to focus on just one, the first crucial, one of the first crucial steps in the inner work I am calling us toward. And that is seeing ourselves as fragment workers. This is the first work. This is the first work of justice formation that is now necessary in the academy. And it is work not yet being done. We, my friends, are fragment workers. There is a passage of scripture, Christian scripture, that I want you to think about as we consider the fragment. Matthew chapter 14, beginning with verse 19. Matthew chapter 14, beginning with verse 19. Then Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. All ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken fragments, 12 baskets full. They took up what was left of the broken fragments. All education, my friends, is in fragments. We never know everything we should know, especially when we teach what we know. We teach fragments, pieces and parts, slices and shards, all you have to do, as you all know, is put a syllabus together and soon you soon realize that you are teaching fragments. Those of us in theological education, we especially know that this is the case because we only have fragments. Fragments of what Jesus said and of his life, only slices of what his disciples said and did. And over the millennia, we only have fragments of all Christian life and thought. But this, my friends, is not a problem. This is the way it should be. We are creatures and we cannot hold everything together. God gives the fragments. God gives the fragments. And it is the weaving together with others, with God, that constitutes the beginning of education, especially theological education. Those of us involved in theological education, we sense this call to the weaving in and through the fragments we work with. Yet the fragment work is all around us in every field, every discipline, and in every intellectual endeavor. The problem begins when we do not see or we deny that we are fragment workers and imagine that we are working toward self-sufficiency, working toward a control, a possession, and a mastery that we each must exhibit. The problem begins when we imagine that we are working toward an individual display of completeness and we deny that there is a shared weaving ahead of us where we together with others weave fragments of knowledge together, allowing things to be added or left out depending on the work we are aiming to do or the task we are aiming to accomplish. You could ask this point, ask at this point, am I talking about interdisciplinarity? 
and interdisciplinary work where people who inhabit different fields bring their work together. Yes, but I'm really talking about something much wider and deeper than just interdisciplinarity. I am talking about how we who teach and learn and write understand who we are as we handle knowledge. We are not those aiming to show white, self-sufficient, masculinist form. We are those showing how to work with the fragments. This is the first kind of fragment work we do. But there is a second fragment work that we must do together. And this is to gather those things that were never meant to be fragments. The second fragment work turns our attention to the shattering effects of modern colonialism, where so many peoples had their worlds torn apart torn into pieces, shattered. So many people, so many students want an education that helps them gather together the fragments that remain, the fragments of their people's cultures, the witness, the, the wisdom and knowledge <clears throat> and ways of being and thinking their histories and their stories, and to weave those fragments with the fragments of all that they are being exposed to in their schools. Tragically, my friends, tragically, my friends, this request often falls on deaf ears as faculty and administrators absolve themselves of any responsibility to help students of formerly colonized peoples and students of color do this vital work. We have fragment work. This is the plea behind the hope for more diverse and inclusive curricula and courses. This is the plea behind more cultural sensitivity training and education. But to be able to hear it requires more than politely acknowledging the importance of diversity. Good that that is. It requires the desire to weave the fragments, to take hold of that history of colonial fragmentation and join in the desire to honor, to remember, to restore what was lost or forgotten, and then to bind it to what must be taught, discovered, learned, and explored. Think of the many students and their peoples who all their lives were told indirectly and oftentimes directly that the wisdom the knowledge of their elders, the cultural practices of their people, the vision of life of those that gave them life are not only tangential to their learning in the academy, but in many ways useless. Think of their quiet hope, their secret plea that they might encounter scholars and professors and administrators that know of the fragmentation of their peoples and know the fragmentation that their peoples have experienced and who are now committed to helping those students and their peoples in the weaving. In order to do this, it will require faculty and administrators who don't imagine that they need to control, possess, or master those fragments of their students the fragments of other peoples in order to be helpful, but only the desire to work with the fragments and the desire for communion and the desire to learn as you teach. But all of this must be done with a view toward the third kind of fragment, the third kind of fragment that we must deal with, and that is the working against the commodity fragment, working against the commodity fragment. We are all caught inside the buying and selling of education. And the danger for us is that we continue to treat life, the life of peoples and of other creatures as things to be known and owned. This brings us back to the horrors of the colonial legacies in which to know a thing was to own a thing and where so much of indigenous life was stolen, packaged, and sold. Another poem for us, another poem for us. To know a thing. 
To know a thing is to possess a thing. They took our land, our bodies, our stories, our rituals, our tools, is to sell a thing. Our dance, our music, our sweat, our passion, our hopes, our dreams, is to have the power. Our birds, our horses, our plant mothers, our tree fathers, our loud streams, our quiet rivers, to discard a thing, our blood, our cells, our brains, our skulls, our teeth, our shit, and then find a thing, our anger, our courage, our creative resistance, our allegiance, our loyalty, and resell that thing, or our sight, our sound, our fear, our faith, give that thing away or have that thing stolen. It was stolen from the beginning. That was not a thing to begin with, but was my life. We who inhabit the academy live in the danger of becoming intellectual merchants untouched by the fragments we touch. We resist that merchant behavior <clears throat> with its relentless drive to commodify everything by understanding the gift and the responsibility of touching fragments. I come back to the passage in Matthew where the disciples were tasked with gathering the fragments that remain. My friends, they were inside a joyous work. In the aftermath of a miracle where Jesus turned a crowd from a major problem with its hunger and its needs to a place of praise. Jesus and the crowd were the beginning of the gathering where it was possible to see the beginnings of a new reality of belonging. <clears throat> this is where education begins. And if it's done well, this is where it will end. But you might ask, but you might ask at this point as I'm closing, could not control, possession, and mastery be redeemed, Brother Jennings? Could they not be in hopes of a more refined vision of human cultivation and becoming, be extracted from their colonial matrix, remove all the blood and guts and bones and tears and anguish and horror that they have produced in the quest for their attainment? Could they be cleaned up and reinserted in the work of becoming, of cultivating mind and body and spirit? Such a hope for extraction and restoration forgets that these virtues, these dismal virtues in our time, have been tattooed with colonial ambition and desire and marked by spectacular success. Many who have dreamed their world through the white self-sufficient man have succeeded. Many who have angled their life toward a becoming and a building that would show them to be the finished man have triumphed marvelously in this life. Make no mistake, the colonial master's dream is right now being lived by many. But for those of us, <clears throat> but for those of us who seek to cultivate a different kind of belonging, one not aimed at the finished man, we have aimed our teaching and our writing and our living toward a gathering and a moment of an appearing captured so beautifully in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when it is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Something is finished indicated in this passage of scripture. Now we are God's children. Now we are geared toward the gathering of the beloved and with the beloved. This is the finish we seek, where all the fragments, my friends, will finally and beautifully be woven together.
together. Thank you very much. I look forward to a conversation. Dr. David Clotier from Catholic University of America, School of Theology and Religious Studies. We'll have David offer a response. Thank you, Larry. And uh, thank you to Dr. Jennings for that uh, talk. Uh, it is uh, intimidating to say the least to respond to a talk as powerful as, as that one was in content and delivery. Um, uh, and so I will simply try to offer a couple elaborations and a couple questions. Um, I anticipated the power of Dr. Jennings' talk because I had the privilege of uh, working with Dr. Jennings when I was a graduate student at Duke in the late 1990s. I uh, TA'd uh, his fantastic Introduction to Christian Theology uh, class that blew away the seminarians, as you can imagine from his great presentation tonight, whether he's talking about Chalcedon or colonialism, it's, it's always a powerful experience, right? Um, I, I also uh, am really privileged to respond because when I read his book, After Whiteness, I found myself thinking, this book should be called After Dukeness. Um, and that there was some, some really, really powerful insight uh, that came out of those pages because of the fact that I had inhabited this particular space. Um, the, the, the Duke that I inhabited in the late 1990s, I, I think, uh, was, was peculiar, uh, peculiarly white, perhaps, in, in two ways. One, it uh, al almost uniquely for the time, uh, sought to align the tasks of being the church and being a place of the absolute most top quality scholarship. It was as if we believed that the cross of Christ would triumph over all its enemies due to our outstanding scholarship, or at least the fact that we could argue everyone else. Um, that was a, 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 a stunning dynamic and, and one that almost all of us who were educated there hopefully uh, learned to criticize. And I certainly learned to criticize it even more uh, in reading Dr. Jennings' book. Um, because it also produced a kind of unique uh, problem of, of character that affected almost all of us. I think I would have called it arrogance prior to reading the book, but I think Dr. Jennings is right to identify it as a kind of whiteness, a kind of mastery um, that, that we were taught, a kind of finish, um, or to quote his presentation, an invitation to become someone significant by learning to see like the master sees. Um, th this, kind of, uh, this kind of whiteness, as Dr. Jennings makes clear, is a way of seeing or a way of being, a way of, a way of ordering the world um, that isn't e exclusively the possession of people who happen to be white and male, but for those of us who are white and male and who are trained into it, Dr. Jennings' words are more or less like Jonathan Edwards' sinners in the hands of an angry god a kind of warning um, that should be taken to heart as much as possible. Um, so I find his, his vision of the alternative for theological education an alternative that is more exciting, and more collaborative. A, a great analogy, I think, in the Catholic context to what Pope Francis has brought to the church. I often have, have to explain to the seminarians that that I teach, that the last two popes were professor popes, and that it was an oddity in the history of the church that, that we had two popes who both were professors, who manifested many of these qualities, for better and for worse, that Dr. Jennings describes, um, and that Pope Francis is, for, for the church, a kind of antidote to that, or at least a, a a, an attempt to see past the, I'm looking at the words, the narrowed sight lines um, that come out of having a teaching authority headed by someone who is trained as a, 
as a theological professor. So I think from a Catholic perspective, this is a, a, a powerful thing as well, and one that in the Francis era, we need to appreciate. I also want to highlight um, the, the way in which Dr. Jennings' presentation tries to move us from thinking of a theological scholarship as an individual display of completeness to something like a shared enterprise or a weaving um, where we, we act in much more collaborative ways. Um, I, I still think that the habits of scholarship in, in the academy, not just the theological academy, um, are unusually scholarly, uh, uh, solitary, I'm sorry, they're unusually solitary, and that uh, Dr. Jennings' work is, should encourage us to think about modes of scholarship that are much more collaborative, and particularly collaborative with um, uh, 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 collaborative with people from different backgrounds, from diverse backgrounds. It sounds so hackneyed at this point, um, uh, particularly from backgrounds that are more international. I was struck uh, tonight listening to Dr. Jennings' words about the challenges that I face as a white male American teaching seminarians in a classroom. I have Latin American seminarians in my classroom. I have seminarians from Africa in my classroom. We have Asian students in our classrooms. And I struggle to know how to be an adequate professor in a classroom where I'm painfully aware of the fact that I just don't have the background to be able to speak to these people and to think about what mode of education I need to adopt in order to make that, that classroom more uh, a classroom of belonging, as Dr. Jennings describes. So there, there is much here and much more in the book. So I, I really do encourage all my colleagues uh, uh, to, to read After Whiteness and uh, ask me about the details of some of the stories. I can <laughs> say something about it, although not as much as Dr. Jennings. Um, my, my two questions, um, uh, one is, uh, trying to think through the relationship between three things. One is the enterprise of theological scholarship specifically, those books that we write, those conferences that we go to. Um, the second enterprise being the church itself, the, the church, the congregation, the gathered people of God. And then this middle thing that I think we're calling theological education, which isn't precisely scholarship, right? Most of, most of my ministry students don't read the technical tomes that, that constitutes theological scholarship. Um, but it's also not the work of the church, right? It's an educational enterprise. It's a scholarly enterprise. We need to have certain credentials, supposedly, to be able to teach these things. So one of the things that, that I, ho I hope we can think through is what is the relationship between the scholarly enterprise, which is a certain kind of focused enterprise, the educational enterprise, and... Um, the, the church itself, the, the people of God. And I, I especially was thinking about what is the connection between um, elite Protestant divinity schools that are located at prestigious secular universities. Um, because that's a kind of crossover that encourages the kind of self-sufficient scholarship that Dr. Jennings is talking about. Um, my, my second question um, and this is one thing that I definitely learned at Duke and I'm, I'm not leaving behind, is um, to ask about the relationship between the explicitly theological or Christological fragment work that is, is being encouraged here and the powerful social movements that mouth some of the same sentiments. Um, uh, certainly at Duke, we were, we were taught to view with suspicion the, the uh, conflation of the imperatives of the political nation state and the imperatives of the church. Um, and I think one of the challenges that, that we all have in theological education is to think about properly about the way in which to relate um, discourses, discourses about race, but also all of these other kinds of differences um, in a theological setting to the way in which those discourses can get deployed um, in, in, uh, in the, the larger uh, nation state politics. Um, but both of those questions, of course, are, are fruits of the amazing uh, gifts that Dr. Jennings has, has given us. And I, I look forward to hearing responses and everyone's questions.
Thank you, Dr. Cloutier. I'm going to invite Dr. Jennings to respond to those uh, two initial questions, if you will. So the first about the relationship between scholarship and the church and the middle ground of theological education between. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, David, for the, the one's wonderful comments. And, um, you know, it's so interesting. My colleagues at Duke, the first thing that they've done when they read the book is that they've, they've spent hours trying to figure out, okay, who is this? I think I know who this one is. I think I... <laughs> I tell them, please stop. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> because <laughs> everything has been changed. But it's so funny to hear some of them just, it's been hours. I think that's so-and-so. No, no, that's not, that's so-and-so. But in any event, thank you for your, your, your wonderful summary and these great questions. Well, the, the, the three things you mentioned, theological, um, uh, theological education and the, the work and the scholarship that's involved with that, but also the scholarly work that comprises so many of our, our um, disciplines, all our disciplines, in fact, uh, the production and the dissemination of scholarship and the life of the church. These are three things. But what I want to suggest is that they are joined, they are joined by, by three realities, and my design chapter talks about this. But, and let me, let me speak about the first way that they're joined. They're joined by the cultivation of attention. So all three of these point to the need to cultivate attention. And here is where we have to understand the tragedy of uh, an educational reality and evaluative ecologies that have been deformed, mangled by the quest toward forming people to be the white self-sufficient man. It's distorted what it means to pay attention. We want, at the heart of everyone who comes into the educational experience, to have cultivated the ability to pay attention. And so, the, the person heading toward the church, we want people who will pay attention, whether they are pastors or they're nurses, we want them to pay attention. We want the scholar, obviously, the scholar is one to pay attention. And those of us who are involved in the whole educational enterprise, we want to pay attention. But now here's the problem. For all three, we've all been infected by the distorting reality of the, of the press toward white self-sufficiency, which means that we've been taught that what it means to pay attention looks only one way. It looks like a European. It looks like a German. <laughs> it looks like Hegel. That, that's what it means to look like you're paying attention. So what does that mean? It means that the idea of attention has been squeezed down, broken into pieces, crumbled and pressed inside a word called rigorous, called serious. Rather than taking the word rigorous and serious, breaking it open, and then making sure it, it is mapped properly across what it means to pay attention. So many tears, and you all, everybody on this Zoom knows this. There are so many tears shed from faculty offices, administrative offices, students, uh, dorm, student, student apartments and dorms, because they have not been taken seriously. They have not been paid attention to, and they have been forced into a very narrow vision of what it means to pay attention. And so before we can talk about what distinguishes these three intellectual endeavors, we have to first understand what, what joins them. And what joins them first is a robust, beautiful reality of paying attention that moves through all three. So how will we distinguish them? We would distinguish them not by intensity. We would distinguish them by a kind of duration and an object, right? The duration, the amount of time the scholar will send, spend in her office pouring over a text, the amount of time a pastor will spend, the amount of time we who are administrators spend trying to work things out, the duration is different, but also the object's different, right? And so we want to understand that, but here's, here's what's crucial. We no longer want an evaluative ecology that creates a hierarchy between those. 
we are inside of an evaluative ecology that has created a hierarchy of attention. Serious goes to the scholar. Nobody else gets that. Everybody else gets something else. But then there's the other two. There, there's the cultivation of affection and the cultivation of resistance. I won't take time to go into that, but th that's the beginning. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the thing about the fragment work, this is your second question. The thing about the fragment work and the thing about understanding ourselves as fragment workers is that we have to see two tasks, two crucial tasks that we have not seen together. Th that first task is a freeing task. Anyone who's done a PhD has been denied the joy, the joy of learning and thinking about their work as a fragment worker. Everyone who's ever done a PhD has been told you have to have mastery over all the fragments. And if you don't have mastery, shame on you. And it's, it's ridiculous. No one can have mastery over the fragments. And in fact, theologically, we're not supposed to have mastery over the fragments. We're not supposed to. We are supposed to do a weaving. Because why? Because we depend upon the spirit to show us what to weave. The first few years of putting a syllabus together, as I said, people understand this. You, you, you never teach everything you know. Any minister knows you never preach everything you know. You, pe you preach, you teach what's necessary, and you weave it to other things. But So freeing ourselves from the idea of mastery and grasping the idea of holding to it, the joy of being a fragment worker. But that has to be joined with the second one. And here, we don't want to think at the level of the nation state, or we don't want to think of the level of you know, liberal or conservative. We don't, we don't, all that way of thinking is useless for this second fragment work. The second fragment work is meeting our students, meeting our students inside the histories we share. So meeting our students who are trying to piece together what's, what's left, what's, what, what, what is it about my people and my culture that, that remains after the devastating realities of colonialism and Western expansion and Western oppression. How do, I, how do I piece that together inside a Christian vision when many don't think it can ever be honored in a Christian vision? And seeing ourselves as helping with that weaving, but, not, but your point, which you, which you mentioned earlier, David, I think is exactly where the problem hits us. Because for faculty, once we've been shaped inside the idea that mastery is what's required of fragments, we are scared to touch the fragments of our students. Because I don't, I don't know enough about Latinx culture. I don't know enough about Korean culture. I don't know enough about, about African-Americans. I don't know. Well, the point is, you, we're not asking you to have mastery over it. We're asking you to come to love it and appreciate it. Here's, here's the reality, friends, and now because uh, I want to give more time for questions. But here's the reality we're facing in all our schools across the entire ATS family of schools. Most of the ATS family of schools have had generations of BIPOC students, whether we're talking about Koreans, African-Americans, Latinx. <clears throat> but if you look at, if you look at the way the faculties do their thinking, their collective thinking, their collective teaching, their individual think, you would not think that those BIPOC students have been there more than a year. There is something deeply problematic in a school that has had 25 years of Korean students coming through. And the faculty itself shows no signs of having had 25 years of Korean students coming through. In 25 years, through the stories itself, you ought to know a lot about the reality of Korean students. But so here's the problem. Why is it that they don't? It's not because their, their minds are not strong enough to learn. It's not because they don't appear to. What's wrong is that they don't see that as a part of their fundamental work of weaving. So after 25 years of teaching African-American students to have a faculty that still doesn't understand the complexities of African-American life has to do with the evaluative ecology of the school. It has to do with the formation of intellectual life at that school. It doesn't have to do, it doesn't have to do with faculty that are incapable of learning. All right, let me stop there so we have time for more questions. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sanders to uh, share a question or two. 
first of all, want to say how much uh, profoundly I, I appreciate um, our conversation so far this evening. Dr. Jennings, would you venture to say a word about how your analysis translates into the HBCU environment. For instance, you were just um, noting that um, there's this sort of blindness to the fact that you may have had 25 years of Korean students or 25 years of African-Americans, but in the HBCU environment, does that exactly translate to how we uh, teach our white students or not? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Well, you know, I think there is some translation there. The question is, <clears throat> what fragment work do we imagine we're doing in HBCUs as predominantly and also predominantly white students? But what fragment work do we imagine we're, we're doing? So one of the, as you know, one of the great sticking points for so many students, especially in HBCUs, is that they may have had 25 years of Caribbean students come through, 25 years of African students come through, but you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it by the shape of things so that the, the, the work of the weaving has not yet been done. I, I, I am here at Yale, I'm realizing this part of the country, there's a, there's a large contingent of West Indians in the Northeast quarter, this part. But it's interesting that at a place like Yale, but at many places, there's no, there's no cumulative effect of having decades in here, you know, centuries of Caribbean students. And I would dare, I would dare venture, my dear sister, as you know, that I think the same thing could be said at so many HBCUs. The challenge, of course is that there is a certain reality of white male self-sufficiency that has distorted, I didn't get a chance to talk about affection, but has distorted the reality of affection such that people are angled toward loving and appreciating what's imagined <clears throat> as the height of cultural formation, European culture. And so there's a sense in which um, that is seen, the, 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 the ongoing fragrance of the European upon one is seen as a desirable thing to have. And so the tragedy there is, as we know, in so many institutions, and not just HBCUs, but all, all across the planet where Western education has shaped the educational endeavor, there is still that sense that if, I, if my students graduate and they're able to speak French, even though they've never been to France. If they're, if they're able to um, articulate with some um, detail um, Hegel's, Hegel's deepest insights that the finish has happened, the finish has happened. So, so we are caught up in that problematic. And the question becomes, how do we switch it? How do we change it? How do we, as educators, show ourselves to be learners not for the sake of mastery, but for the sake of communion. I, I, what would it mean for a school that when a new generation of students comes, they see, they hear, they sense that these, this faculty and this staff, this administration, they never been to my home, but they already have a sense of what's happening in my home. And the reason they do is not because they went to the library and read a bunch of books. Okay, that's good but they've had several generations and they've listened carefully. I've had several generations of Jamaican students. And so I, I have some sense, some sense. I, I don't have mastery, but I have some sense of what life, what life is like. And if, if I'm clear that what I'm, what I'm saying is not that I have mastery, is that I, I have some appreciation, some love for where you come from. And you can sense in me, not because I'm trying to prove myself, but just because I'm sharing now my expanded palette of love, that you are actually, even though you are in Washington, D.C., you're actually at home. 
Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thank you for that wonderful question, Dr. Sanders. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanders. And uh, uh, we uh, have a few more minutes. Uh, there is one question about uh, fragment workers that might uh, be have some of those skills related to traditional disciplines and whether their, some of their um, skills can be translated towards the uh, vision of education for belonging, towards the transition of affection and attention that you are speaking of. Um, and uh, they had mentioned historians work with fragments, as you know, uh, biblical era archeologists. Uh, I would add to that pastoral care workers in practice work with yeah. fragmented lives. Uh, uh, missiologists work with with fragments, trying to uh, defragment their uh, the tradition they bring and and work with others to uh, reweave it in in cultural terms. Mm -hmm. Are there analogies to what's going on with some disciplines that will um, help those of us who have been so entrenched, uh, like myself, in the uh, uh, the finished product, the finished man, the finished scholar? to help those of us uh, make some um, analogies that can begin to understand fragment work um, related to uh, disciplines that we might know. This well, new know, discipline, yeah, new fragment work. Yeah, the, 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 key, the key here, I think, is um, to, to capture again, to capture again the joy of learning for faculty. Um, something happens to us after we have finished those degrees and, and started the teaching. Um, we, we start to treat the materials of our discipline as um, small, unruly animals that we have to control. Instead of thinking of all of it, like an artist or an artisan. What am I working with? What am I working with? What, what material am I working with this week? How will I play with it? What will I do with it? Mm -hmm. and, and there's something crucial about capturing again the sense of the artist and the artisan working with various materials. Some things you set aside, you know, and you, you're working with something. And, the, the, the entire evaluative vision of what you're doing changes. So many of us are still caught in the evaluative vision of our Dr. Vaters and Dr. Maters. Mm -hmm. You still don't seem to have that. Um, you still don't seem to be able to understand exactly what Kant was saying there in this third critique. I'm very And the man's dead. <laughs> Did you hear him in the back of your head? Yeah, yeah, you, st you still don't seem to understand. I, I, I don't, you know, your translation here of Romans is you know, still problematic. I, you've, you've been saying this for years, but it's still problematic. Yeah. And the, at some point in time, we have to free ourselves from that evaluative logic so that we can enter with our students into the joy of playing with the fragments. And, and I think that's key because it's not a question of, okay, which fragment? <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> it's you're playing with the fragments so so you you're trying to say okay you know so it, it, and so here we, we we come back to the to the logic of the syllabus creation and many of us don't step back and reflect on the logic of syllabus creation we're inside of right okay they can't read all of that okay i'm just gonna read okay just these 25 pages because these Halfway in it, the person says this, and then they say, "Okay, that's that's enough. They can just get that little piece right there." Okay, okay, mm, not the whole book, the third chapter, okay, and maybe half of that third chapter. Right, okay, I'll fit that those two together, tie that together. Okay, and then my lecture is going to kind of roll inside of it, and all. so so if if we could step back and understand, think carefully about the mm -hmm. art of what we're doing, mm -hmm. and then but here's my point from from from, and this goes back to. Dr. Sanders' wonderful question. If we could take a step back and say, okay, the student is thinking, okay, you know, this sounds a lot like what my, my Jamaican mother used to say. And uh, some, some like that preacher used to preach. Okay, how, do, how can I weave those things together with what I'm reading here? If, if we could see that there's a quilt happening. And some, sometimes what you have to do 
you know, if, if you if you've ever watched quilters uh, do their work together, this is a perfect example. So quilters each have their satchel of pieces, right? And then there's a there's, there's the quilt they're working on, and then they're sitting across from each other, and then someone pulls out a piece, and it's oh baby, that's a beautiful piece you got right there. I love the green and the little speckles of brown in that. You know, that would work when, um, what you think about, it? oh yeah, I think those two will work together. Okay, put those two together. And then, and then I got this red one right here. That oh, that works with what you got. So if we could understand that, that creative work of looking and seeing, matching, that begins to open up a new, new possibility for us. It's a mistake, a profound mistake of our formation to have been told that mastery is possible. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the problems with comprehensive exams that still exist to this moment. Every place I've been, I'm, I've been to a number of places to talk about doctoral formation. Comprehensive exams um, are in many places, uh, not only stabs in the dark, but um, a sharing of ignorance, not in terms of what the students are doing, but what pedagogically, what are we trying to do with a comprehensive exam? So somebody doing a PhD in New Testament, how are they going to have comprehensive knowledge of the New Testament? Give me a break. Someone's doing a PhD in theology. How are you going to have comprehensive? Are you kidding? Historical theology. Are you, you're kidding, right? No, but they need to know. How are they going to know <laughs> at this moment? I mean, that makes, but to tell students, you must show mastery of it is already to initiate them in a lie that they carry right into the, into the classroom. Which means they, they have never entered the joy of learning the fragments. So I've been trying at my institution to try to change it, but of course there's lots of pushback, you know, but trying to change it because I don't want, to, I don't want a doctoral student to walk out thinking, and, and many of you know, some of the most, the, some of the, the people who come into a doctoral program arrogant and leave with the hugest heads, are the ones who were told that they did fabulous on their exams. And yes, you have met, yes, I ain't Their heads are so big they can't get through doors anymore because they have been, believed the illusion that they now somehow have covered the waterfront. Come on, please. And was that the point in the first place? I'm sorry, I'm fussing that. No, that's, uh, that, uh, that captures it perfectly. I heard some echoes of uh, some e e traumatic experiences myself right there. Um, one more question that we have time for, and it's about how do we spot fragment workers while doing a faculty search? <laughs> you, you, um, you, you can only, you can only um, present people with the option of becoming fragment workers. No one, no one is a fragment worker coming out of a doctoral program right? or even early in their career, even some mid-career. You, you, you have to invite them and see if that's something they want. Mm -hmm. And some, as I said, some people um, have successfully become the white self-sufficient man. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they, their, their response to you is no thank you. I, I'm, I'm on my way and I don't need to see myself as a framework. I don't need to think about collaboration or all that other stuff. I'm, I'm on my way to the very top of my guild. Thank you very much. But for those who do want that possibility, you have to show an institution, show yourselves as an institution to be about that. And that, and, and let me be clear, framework doesn't mean that, you know, you, it's all team teaching and, you know, it's, it's always, you know, a kind of, uh, structured, rig structured, rigid uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. It means that you're inviting people into the art. You're inviting people into the, to the work and the play and the freedom to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have to transition. And uh, there are one or two more questions that uh, perhaps I will email uh, Dr. Jennings, uh, but let's all uh, share our appreciation for Dr. Jennings with uh, uh, some claps or some emojis, whatever you wish. We're uh, delighted uh, that you bring this challenging word to, to us. Glad um, to do. Glad thank to do. you. Thank you.